Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. This is Jason, host of Finding Words Financial. And today I want to talk about a recent scientific breakthrough and relate it back to the investment world. And I do that pretty frequently on this channel where I talk about sort of off the wall scientific things and how you can end up making money on, uh, on, on what's to come. And today's subject is a bit more opaque than some of the subjects I've covered in the past but really important. And it's really going to affect a lot of maybe even people listening to this live stream at some point in their lives. And we're going to talk about antibiotic drug resistance, how it's become a growing problem. Uh, anyone involved in the health field knows that many of the most potent uh, antibacterial drugs, antibiotics that we've been using for the last hundred years since the 1920s are now becoming ineffective. Um, things like MRSA or a uh, hot topic in some of the sports that I'm involved in because staph infections are frequent and they are frequently resistant to medication. So really important discovery made in the last couple of weeks, or at least announced in the last couple of weeks, research has been going on in this field for about 40 years now, but really made a leap forward beginning about a decade ago with the onset of a new investment frontier, which really should be called uh, computational biology, um, you know, uh, biological informatics, you know, computational genomics or computational chemistry. It's basically using computers to model molecular reactions and uh, try to predict structures and how things work. So this breakthrough that happened recently that's enormously important is a breakthrough compound that destroys over 300 drug-resistant bacteria. These are bacteria that we already recognize cause a problem medically with human beings. Um, they're either resistant to medication or they're widespread, that sort of thing. Very interesting illustration there, but that's not the, uh, the uh, great part here. So the new drug inhibits drug-resistant bacteria without harming helpful microbes, which is very important. The compound infiltrates the defenses of gram-negative bacteria, meaning these are bacteria that have uh, pretty tough protein shells around them that prevent a lot of medications, and, and they have like pumps inside of them that prevent these medications from accumulating in high enough concentrations to actually kill the bacteria. So uh, it can one day, day you be used to treat separate infections. These have already uh, these lab isolates have already be, been tested in mouse models and uh, they look pretty promising. So medicine is constantly on the lookout for drugs that can kill drug resistant bacteria. In February, researchers led by, and I'm not even going to, I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, Despoina Mavridou of the University of Texas found a new way to reduce antibiotic resistance in bacteria that cause human diseases, such as E. coli, pneumonia, and I don't know what that other one is. Uh, and I actually read through all of the research on these, so you guys don't have to do that. Um, but one of the things we should get out of the way right away is that I am not a biologist. Uh, my knowledge on this really comes from being an enthusiastic amateur and looking into this for the last decade or so. But even when I read a lot of these uh, research papers in the form that they're published in journals, a lot of times I don't understand a lot of what's being said in there. And sometimes it's actually hard to find a specialist who will be patient enough to explain it to me. So um, so then in May, researchers successfully used bacteriophages. These are uh, these are things that attack bacteria to treat antibiotic resistant uh, microbacterial lung infection. The process led the way for a young national Jewish, Jewish healthcare patient with cystic fibrosis to receive a life saving uh, lung transplant. Finally, in July, scientists from Rockefeller University synthesized a novel antibiotic with the help of computer models of bacterial gene products capable of killing even bacteria resistant to other antibiotics. Researchers have reported that a new molecule that inhibits drug-resistant bacteria in, a lab, in lab experience uh, experiments, as well as in mice with pneumonia and urinary tract infections, according to a statement published in ACS Central Science on Wednesday, which is a well-known and respected uh, periodic journal. The researchers uh, further note that this compound called uh, fabomycin could one day be used to treat drug-resistant infections in humans, as it has been reported to fight off more than 300 drug-resistant bacteria. So uh, gram-negative bacteria are a class of microbes that infect millions of people worldwide, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, causing conditions such as pneumonia, urinary tract infections, and bloodstream infections. These bacteria are especially difficult to treat because they have strong defense systems, tough cell walls that keep out uh, most antibiotics and pumps that efficiently remove these antibiotics that get inside. But microbes can be used also, or microbes can also mutate to avoid multiple drugs. Furthermore, the treatments that do work 
aren't very specific and they eradicate many kinds of bacteria, including those that are beneficial. And uh, we probably all know somebody who has uh, enormous problems with their gut. And uh, we kind of look to overuse of antibiotics. You, you know, the people that you know that every time they get a cold, they go out and get antibiotics and they tell you, oh, it can't harm anything. It is actively harming things. It is horrible for your gut bacteria. And we don't understand the billions and billions of, of interactions that our gut bacteria have on uh, the rest of our body. And it's going to take a long while to unravel those. So one of the things I didn't find in here was any indication as to where the software and hardware came from that created these uh, molecular models. So in doing some research, I, I, I've come up with uh, a list of companies that are involved in uh, computational biology in one form or another, be that in genomics or chemistry or, uh, or, or other forms of biology here. Um, <clears throat> but most of these companies are actually privately traded at this point. They're privately owned at this point and they're not traded. I did pull up one of them uh, that is involved in this space, Relay Therapeutics, and we'll take a look at them. Right now, investing in any one of these companies as an individual company would just be an enormous risk with uh, not, not even really a pathway to profitability for a lot of these companies. And I would really suggest that you uh, widen out your possibilities for success here with some diversification, looking at a biotechnology um, ETF or something like that, or, or mutual fund. Uh, <clears throat> And, and I think you'll see this when we when we start, take a look at Relay Therapeutics here. It's probably one of the most famous companies in this field. But also take a look at the companies that are providing the, hoft, the hardware and the software for these industries as they're very important too. So both of the articles uh, that I found that uh, talk about this novel bacteria um, and it's one of the major problems that poses a threat to humans, kills millions of people worldwide, even stating that, that people that get infected with these, uh, that, that are treated for these infections, a huge percentage of them end up dying within two years. Um, but this article right here, uh, says that it's validating a novel approach to drug discovery. Uh, this study is an example of computational biology, genetic sequencing, and synthetic chemistry coming together to unlock the secrets of bacterial evolution. So the whole idea is getting bacteria to kill each other. And uh, it's not surprising that most antibiotics are based on bacteria. And there's a huge issue with the fact that most antibiotics are based on bacteria. Uh, they're all gaining resistance to this. And it's also difficult to synthesize these in a lab, or at least it has been in the past. And it's difficult to actually find them or to get them to replicate in a lab also. So for the past 15 years, um, these labs have adopted alternative methods that include finding antibacterial genes in the soil, growing them inside more lab-friendly bacteria. And this approach uh, has had limits in the past. So genetic sequencing and biosynthetic gene clusters have been developed and worked together to code for several proteins which are which have uh, antibiotic origins. So with present technology though, these clusters are frequently inaccessible is what they're saying. Um, so, and they also go th through in this article to talk about how computational biology was used to figure this out. Uh, Shoeless Joe from the UK says, hey Jason, hey Shoeless Joe, always uh, on my live streams. Thank you very much for attending. If you guys have never been on one of my live streams before, uh, I do like to cover some off the wall stuff and try to relate this back to uh, investing. So biotech has absolutely been on a tear in the last couple of months, and it's really 10 stocks that are driving the entire index up. And we're going to take a look at those 10 stocks right now in this Barron's article. Um, so why is biotech soared? These 10 stocks are the biggest reason. We're going to go through them right here. You can see that things like global blood therapeutics, Karuna therapeutics, beam therapeutics, these are up 200%, 176%, 128%, 117%. Mm. You could say that these companies were oversold. You could say that they were overvalued. Um, I, I would have to say that based on current cash flows, all of them are overvalued, e even at previous levels that they're up from, even at you know being up 200%. These companies are far away from profits uh, at this point. They are science projects at this point. They are targets for acquisition at some point in the future. But as far as right now, investing in them is is, is, is very risky. Uh, the exception would probably be uh, Twist and Intelia. Those would be the two companies there that are a little bit more on solid uh, footing. But Fate Therapeutics, Replogen, Apellus Pharmaceuticals, 
Uh, uh, Pellis Pharmaceuticals is another one that may be on a little bit more solid footing. But once again, folks, this is not a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any security that I talk about here. Um, you can't make those recommendations via YouTube. But like I said, this whole field is really a new frontier in investing that is worth investigating and worth keeping an eye on. And ju just for example, I'm going to pull up one of the companies I was, I was talking about that's really into bioinformatics right now. And you'll see kind of what a mess it is in, um, you know, in terms of being an investment. They went public in 2020. They pretty much dropped like a rock since then. Uh, earnings per share is at negative $3.85. It's about 50% more volatile than the index. 52 week, week range is all over the place. And volume is, meh. you know, average volume is a million shares. That's pretty good. Volume today is actually kind of uh, slacking. But <clears throat> when we take a look at financials here, um, they've three out of the last four quarters, they've missed estimates uh, and they have rising losses and seriously declining revenues. And a, a lot of this is because they're really sort of pre-revenue companies to a large degree. The most amount of revenue they ever had was $82 million in 2020. And in 2021, that dropped to 3 million. Okay. So they were barely, uh, basically have nothing but losses in there. So folks that are buying this stock at $19 a share, uh, that is a big gamble. Uh, that is a huge gamble. And um, I, I don't see a reason to invest in any one of these companies as an individual risk. And let's talk about why that is. I've been studying this for 10 years um, because reading scientific articles is my hobby. This is what I do for fun. I, I realize that's not fun for a lot of people. But after 10 years of reading this, I still don't actually have the educational background to understand uh, really everything that I'm reading. And especially when it comes to a lot of the chemistry, I don't understand everything that I'm reading. So I'm gaining insights that are sometimes incorrect. And I think that it would be very difficult for me as a layman, but as an enthusiastic investor to say that this company is going to go to the moon. This company is a solid investment. This technology is going to be one that's used by everyone on the planet. Now, <clears throat> it is interesting to say that this idea, though, this breakthrough compound uh, that destroys over 300 drug resistant bacteria and uh, compounds like these are going to save millions of lives in the future. Millions of people die every year from bacterial infections. And this is one of the ways that we can prevent that from happening. Much like uh, penicillin was hailed as a miracle drug back in the early uh, 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, especially during World War II, uh, we're probably going to see new drugs emerge from this type of research. Okay. So <clears throat> another uh, article to pay attention to is this one from Goldman Sachs. And uh, this gives a much better uh, rundown of how computational biology is going to transform R&D. It's going to be the primary mechanism for drug discovery in the future. And Goldman Sachs has a great article in here. I didn't actually link those, this one in the bio. I did link some other stuff in the bio though. I probably should. I'll add that into the comments right here. So um, hold on just a second. All right. So let me add that into the comments right here. So the, uh, and this is a podcast uh, and I, I highly uh, recommend that you go back and uh, listen to this podcast. It's absolutely amazing. The information they go through and they talk about some of the uh, investment possibilities. This entire field though, even though it's really about a decade old, it is still in its infancy. It's still very fractured with many, many companies involved in the space. I listed a bunch of them in the description here. But then we talk about bioinformatics worldwide, and this is a list of just about um, 120 of them. And you can see that a lot of them are located in uh, California, um, and a lot of them are located in Canada. But the majority of them are located in California um, and in Southern California for the most part. So San Diego, <clears throat> Carlsbad, uh, San Francisco being in San Jose, being huge contributors to this field. Um, of course, there are a number of there, not as many of them as China as I thought. India has quite a few of them. Israel has a few of them. Uh, Israel has always been a powerhouse in uh, in research and development. And in fact, I think that there's still a Israel specific investment fund through uh, through ARK Invest. I haven't paid that much attention to it. So, uh, but Boston is another, or Massachusetts is another uh, hotbed of activity for the uh, bioinformatics field. So, bioinformatics molecular modeling and all that, they really should be separate disciplines right now. I'm kind of all grouping them together. So um, most of these are like cloud informatics platforms that help biological teams 
accelerate the R&D and model, um, uh, mo do molecular modeling. So extremely important going forward, heavily AI dependent. This is one of the reasons I keep talking up uh, NVIDIA because they are uh, heavily involved in this space as well. It's not a part of the business <clears throat> that receives a lot of uh, press attention. I did do a video on this a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, uh, about NVIDIA eating, basically eating the S&P 500 in the next decade or so. I think that NVIDIA may end up being one of the largest companies or may end up comprising the largest portion of the S&P 500 based on market cap in about a decade or so, even surpassing Tesla at some point, uh, as they are also involved, heavily involved in autonomous driving, in electric vehicles, bioinformatics, uh, genomics, the AI space, cloud computing, and all that. So um, I think that maybe even one of the better ways to invest in this field in its entirety it's to not necessarily look at these bioinformatics companies, these uh, computational chemistry companies, but to take a look at the companies that are selling them the hardware and designing the software to do this type of business. So uh, that's kind of what I wanted to say about this today. There's about 16 minutes of me rambling on about an exciting scientific discovery that is likely to uh, that is likely to save millions of people in the future. And this is a synthetic antibiotic developed through computer modeling. And I think that's very important. So I want to open this up to any questions uh, really involving any stocks today. We can go through and talk about the stock market as well. Uh, the market is closed at this point. Let me see. Uh, my internet connection rarely uh, cooperates with me, but markets barely moved today. The Russell 2000 small caps up about 0.7%. The NASDAQ 100 up about 0.4%. The S&P up about 0.3 and the Dow Jones up about 0.1%. So a relatively flat day on the market as the market continues to digest uh, Fed meeting minutes. I do tend to agree with some of the headlines today that uh, the market really sort of misjudged the uh, dovish tone from the last Fed meeting. And the med Fed minutes really show a commitment to uh, raising interest rates in the future, which is going to make... Um, which is going to cause a repricing of future cash flows. If future cash flows for all these companies that are listed uh, on that list of bioinformatics companies, if future cash flows are even reasonable, you're still going to have to reprice them uh, in comparison to a risk-free investment. So, and and that's how future cash flows are actually priced. And uh, so, yeah, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and let me know. I do have a little bit less time today than I have in the last couple of days uh, to talk about anything. But if you guys want to talk about any particular stocks that are out there, uh, I'm available to do that. And let me see, let me see here. Um, it seems like medical developments are entering an exponential phase. Do you see longer life expectancies, older populations, and significant societal changes as a result? So we're already seeing significant societal changes that are affecting our economy. Um, one of those is longer life expectancies and more people in retirement. If you look at uh, the uh, the, particip the labor participation rate in particular, it is a little bit lower now than it was in 2019. It's never been higher than I think 63.7% or so. And it's declined every year since the year 2000 as the baby boomers have started to retire and the generation replacing them, there, there just aren't as many of them. And some of that was accelerated by the pandemic where we had surprisingly good uh, asset performance during the pandemic and a lot of baby boomers elected to retire early. And I don't think this is, this is a surprise to people who uh, listen only to certain parts of mainstream media, but really labor force participation has to do with fewer people in the labor force, not because they're choosing not to work, it's because they don't have to because they're closer to retirement. So it looks like the Dow Jones is uh, almost ready to break 34,000 again, which uh, puts it barely down for the year. And uh, I, I think that's uh, pretty significant. I, I don't expect that to last, though. The, the S&P at 42.83, uh, I say that by the end of the year, the S&P has an outside chance of hitting 4,800 again. More likely, I think it'll be a, right at about this level uh, by the end of the year with some volatility in there. So uh, let me see here. Martov says... I'm dollar cost averaging into LNG, global health, and pharma ETF through my ISA, a UK Roth IRA. What do you think? Uh, so I, I wasn't aware that the UK had a version of the Roth IRA. I think that's pretty amazing. And um, I would say that pharma growth is not going to be stable, but it is going to be 
is going to be very volatile, but I do think it's on an upward trend overall the longer that you're in it. I think that at any particular point that you, and I think dollar cost averaging is the best way to go, uh, largely because I think you're going to catch, you're going to buy a higher amount of shares on the lows and a fewer amount of shares on the highs. And over time, you'll actually do better than buying at the average rate. That's kind of the beauty of dollar cost averaging in there. I think that's a fairly good idea. And for the reasons of investor expertise that I quoted before, meaning that you probably, I mean, unless you're a specialist in the field that you're investing in and like, and really the specialization is really, really narrow in these fields. Unless you're a specialist in the field that you're investing in, you probably don't have the best idea of what technologies and discoveries are going to work. And I think that an ETF is probably a really great way to do this. Um, I'm not familiar uh, with uh, LNG Global Health. Um, but there are a number of ETFs out there. I thought about listing those ETFs in the description and then I kind of uh, considered against it because there's so many of them out there at this point. Um, I do own ARCG. That is the one uh, genomics ETF that I own. I am thinking about widening my focus a little bit uh, to concentrate a little bit more on bioinformatics as it draws in a lot of uh, the hardware makers into that space too. So no, I do think uh, that's a very good idea. And uh, yeah, so anyone else want to chime in with suggestions or questions? I am open today, but I did want to talk a little bit about this. So, and I went through and you can see where I went through and I kind of uh, looked at uh, this company, Benevolent AI Systems, which is another company on that list in the description. And uh, yes, diversification is key for long-term investment. And uh, if you like getting 10% a year, uh, then diversification is a great key for a long-term investment. If you have an appetite for risk, uh, then you can take individual risks on stocks. And I've done that. And li like literally the vast majority of my uh, ETF portfolio, which is about 70% of my overall investable net worth, is actually derived from uh, enormous lucky successes in individual stocks. I've gotten lucky on a few stocks. I, uh, when I, when those hit a certain amount, I sold some of that usually, I mean, 15, holding these five, 10, 15 years and diversified across ETFs for a, a, a little bit more safety. So, um, yeah. And Martov, is that legal in general? This must, this must be a UK company that I'm not exactly familiar with. So, uh, very interested in knowing who that is as well, but no, so diversification is great. And I know a ton of, uh, and because I, I work in the financial field, I know a ton of ETF or index fund millionaires. They haven't done anything special. All they've done is dollar cost average into their 401k, into their Roth IRA, and they are millionaires today. And you can do that. Uh, and you, it lessens the risk, but it's still not risk-free. Okay, um, the and, and here's one of the the interesting things about index investing is that as long as you stay invested for five years, your chances of actually losing money are less than twenty percent. If you invest in an individual stock, your chances of losing money in any one year are about twenty percent in that particular stock. So, um, and it's it's a lot more for uh, riskier stocks that don't have current cash flow. So, growth stock investing, in particular, your chances of losing money in any one year are actually really really high. So, um, yeah, I do think that ETFs are a great way to go uh, for industries that you don't have the time or the desire to really understand. Uh, I think it's a great way to go for the large cap portion of your portfolio because Anything on the S&P 500, I think almost all of the information that you would need to make an investment is out there. It's public and the market has probably properly priced it. There are very few, uh, it, there's only a few times where you're going to find value, like true value, where it's worth a lot less than its intrinsic value and future cash flows are. And we went through a period recently, particularly with financials, where that's the case. And I talked about yesterday on my live stream how Margins are increasing for spread lenders at this point. The process of lenders making more and more money during a rising interest rate period has already begun, and it's only going to accelerate. This is going to benefit everyone who's lending at this point. Really, what they're going to be doing right now is fighting for market share. Um, they're going to be fighting for deposits in order to make more and more loans because they still have to keep some uh, deposits uh, requirements satisfied. So, uh, yeah, so uh, we're in a, a very interesting time right now where, once again, um, a lot of stocks that were that were maybe uh, sh maybe in deep value 
in June at this point right now, they're just looking kind of meh for the future. Um, one of the things I'm definitely taking a look at is buying leaps or uh, basically deep in the money calls about a year out on a bunch of different stocks at this time. And a lot of those are really well-known names. So uh, Synopsis Inc. And it's one of the ones that I covered uh, yesterday or, or a couple of days ago. So that I, I sold some puts on those, ended up disposing of those puts. It was one of the few uh, um, short-term trades that I did, disposing of those puts at an almost $800 profit um, just just after or the day after earnings. And now the stock is actually pretty close to um, what would be the execution price if I still held those. SoFi is absolutely taking a beating in the last couple of days, down from over uh, $8 a share. Uh, it briefly crossed over the $8 share, down to about $6.68. Taking a beating and once again in buy territory for me. Money Lion, a company that I've looked at, like I am looking at buying this at under $2 a share and probably quite a bit of it. Um, I'm a little bit less positive on Money Lion than I am SoFi, but yeah. Hold on a second. Um, genomic stocks are way out of my comfort zone. I have no idea when or if they'll make that beautiful thing called profit. And I, I agree with you on that. Individual genomic stocks are way out of my comfort zone. I think that uh, there's going to be a few big winners in the industry that end up snapping up uh, most of everyone else. And we'll end up with four or five really dominant players in the industry and everyone else basically just hoping to get bought out. So um, I, I, I agree with you. I would much rather hold those through an ETF than trying to bet on individual stocks. And I have a couple of favorites. Um, I, I really like uh, Pacific Biosciences but I, I don't necessarily like them for their <laughs> genomic studies. I really like them for uh, their, their computational uh, genomics and uh, their DNA storage technology. The DNA storage technology could turn out to be a giant bust though. Um, it, it doesn't seem like there's a ton of interest in this at this point. There's a lot of academic interest. There doesn't seem to be a ton of um, actual uh, like industrial or or business interest in it at this point. So uh, so this is the reason why I haven't invested in it. it uh, there are a few things with that company that don't make a ton of sense to me. And uh, I, I've reserved, um, I, I basically just had reservations about making uh, an individual investment in that company. So ARCG is the company that is the ETF that I uh, hold now. I'm probably not going to buy any more RG. I have just 100 shares of that. I'm probably looking to buy another genomics ETF or a biotech ETF. If you guys have suggestions, go ahead and put those in uh, the comment bar. I'd be happy to take a look at those at some point and uh, you know, save those for my further research. So um, yeah, and let me see here. Oh, wow. Apple plans to unveil the iPhone 14 at the September 7th event. Uh, that's very interesting. And I don't care about Serena Williams because I don't care about tennis. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond stock suffering his third worst day in a 30-year history. Of course, you guys know that's because the CEO announced that he's dumping almost his entire stake. Or I don't know if it was a CEO, but basically it was down about 20% on that news. Um, I, I, I would be interesting. I, I want to see some academic research at some point on the meme stock phenomenon. I think that it's really fascinating. Um, and, uh, I, I want to see how it actually happened, how everything's put together and it can't be simply just buzz on, uh, Reddit. There has to be some real money behind it. Um, uh, the other news that I think is very interesting is Ethereum has spiked pretty hard over the last couple of months or so. And, um, and I think that has a lot to do with their phase two or whatever they're calling it now, Ethereum 2.0 looking to go live later in September and uh, where they're looking to be, it's a, they're going to switch over to a proof of stake network. And I think that's going to be very interesting. So um, do you think there's such a thing as too much diversification? When I started investing, I was putting money into the tech ETF, a farming ETF, S and P 500, FTSE 100, and I barely made any money. Yeah, there is such a thing called over diversification. Um, so I, I own a fund called VTI, which is a Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, and uh, which is basically uh, an index of all stocks traded around the world. And um, I, I debate on whether or not I should put more money into that all the time. It seems like it's a bit over diversified. So I, I do think that you have to concentrate uh, somewhat and also look at overlap here. With your uh, tech ETF, your pharma ETF, particularly with your pharma ETF and your S&P 500 ETF, you're going to see some overlap in those. So 
Um, I hold an S and P 500 ETF, um, and, and and the the sector ETFs. I like to make sure that they have as little overlap as possible with the S and P 500. What I want is true diversification, because a lot of what you have, uh, one of the big problems with investing over the last 25, 30 years, is that in the past asset classes were not really all that tightly correlated. Today, um, almost all asset classes are showing less and less correlation as investing has become more democratized and also as high-speed trading uh, has become more frequent. And so the the uh, old breakdowns we used with something called modern portfolio theory, have the old models have started to break down a little bit uh, because the, the old rules for diversification and uh, the lack of sector correlation are starting to break down. So I, I think you put need to put a little bit more thought than you have in the past in an, uh, in an ETF portfolio to make sure that you don't have a ton of overlap. And uh, and, and that's a, one of the things I always do when I'm investing with, because like uh, right now, if you invested in the Meta uh, Metaverse ETF, I think the symbol is METV, and you look at the NASDAQ 100, almost everything that's in that, uh, at least the top holdings of the Metaverse ETF are also on the NASDAQ 100. So if you own a NASDAQ 100 ETF and you own the Metaverse ETF, then you basically are not additionally diversified, just barely. You own some small caps that aren't on the uh, NASDAQ 100. And the same is going to be true of a pharma ETF and the S&P 500. There's going to be significant overlap on that. Uh, and also between the pharma ETF and the uh, uh, NASDAQ 100, there's going to be significant overlap. So, uh, and, and that's true also of the uh, lithium uh, ion battery chain ETFs. Uh, but I am investing fairly heavily into LIT, uh, I elected not to buy BATT, so LIT is the one that I have chosen, and largely because that's having they have a uh, a commitment to Albemarle in their portfolio. So, if some of these things get solved, maybe human life can extend to 100 or 150 at some point. So, Eric, I'm going to assume that I'm quite a bit older than you are. Uh, I'm getting closer and closer to 50 years old here. And uh, if they can solve the issue of like my, my muscles are fine. It's my connective tissues that are starting to give way. Uh, I have knee problems right now from a life uh, of, of trying to be an athlete when I'm not really a natural athlete. And uh, yeah, getting older for me is probably going to be kind of painful. So <laughs> I don't know if I want to live to be 100 and 150 years old unless I can do that without the joint pain in uh you know in, in a deterioration of my vertebrae that's actually that's going to come with that so uh, i i would be enormously happy if at some point they have gene therapies uh that can reverse the aging process that would be amazing and then we have a whole new set of problems to solve uh and that would be a set of problems i think that we would joyfully try to solve which is the issue of everyone living too long do you have any opinion on the fidelity global technology fund um i really don't have an opinion that's valid uh, presently. That is a fund that I sold when I worked for a regional bank years and years and years ago. And uh, they uh, they may still have Fidelity Advisor Fund versus like Fidelity's retail funds, where one of them you actually pay an upfront commission and uh, you get lower uh, lower ongoing expenses, and the other one you get higher ongoing expenses but no uh, upfront commission. They may still have that uh, that distinction on there. But those funds um, are not popular with new investors because they never understand how volatile these funds are going to be. When the markets go down, those technology funds just get absolutely crushed. But that fund in particular, from what I remember, remember my knowledge on this is outdated by at least 10 or 12 years. Um, um, it was a solid fund in comparison to its peers. It's just that that entire uh, index is really, really volatile. So um, yeah, so that is that is my opinion on that, which is an opinion that's not very valid because it's 10, 12 years out of date. Uh, I, I think that ETFs, because of their lower expenses, and remember a technology fund or anything that, gr that deals with growth technology is going to have higher uh, administration fees on that because our research costs are quite a bit higher meaning it doesn't cost you much money to do, uh, it doesn't cost you any money at all to do research on a uh, ETF fund, uh, on, on a uh, index ETF. You're just replicating the index. When it comes to a Fidelity Global Technology Fund, they're putting a bit more into due diligence 
despite the fact that they put into due del more into due diligence and it costs them money, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to outperform the index. In fact, most funds don't. So um, anybody here a Dave Ramsey fan? So uh, Dave Ramsey has rapidly loyal fans uh, to the point where there it's 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 more of a religion than it is a, a rational uh, loyalty. And I, I do agree with some of the things that the man says on debt, uh, uh, but he also doesn't ever seem to acknowledge how useful debt is uh, to a lot of people that want to use other people's money to leverage that into dollars, particularly with real estate. He's always telling people to pay off their mortgage. Nothing wrong with paying off a mortgage. I've done that in the past. Um, I have a mortgage now, but I've done that in the past. Nothing wrong with that. It, it's There are reasons beyond financial to do that. But when it comes to his investment advice, he's absolutely dead wrong. Um, so I, I haven't actually gone through one of his, uh, uh, sit, sat down and talked to one of his investment advisors. He can't do it anymore himself or talk about very specifics on his channel or on his uh, show because he's given up all of his licenses. And he kind of had to do that because of all the things that he was saying on his channel. I understand why. There's nothing nefarious about that. It's that you are more free as someone unlicensed to talk about investments than you are as someone who, who is licensed, right? So, um, but I suspect that he's mostly just using the American funds portfolio and that's what he sells to all of his clients. And uh, I, he's given a couple of really good hints based on his portfolio, um, but he is dead wrong about talking. He always talks about, I buy funds that outperform the S&P 500. And then he talks about the four funds that he owns that have done that. So he is dead wrong about there being lots of funds that outperform the S&P 500. He is being affected by something called survivor bias. And in the video that I saw, he actually perfectly illustrated survivor bias in that video without realizing, stating that you know, he went back this many years and out of the 900 funds uh, that were founded a, a years ago and 40 years later, only about 40 of those funds survived and you know, 12 of them outperformed the S&P 500. That's because the rest of them shut down, failed completely, changed strategies, or um, ba or, or basically merged with something else. And, and that's called survivorship bias. So most of them weren't able to outperform their index and actually had to change strategies or ended up liquidating over time. So even, and, and it's true that 80 to 88% of uh, mutual funds, actively managed funds in any one year are not going to outperform their index. Furthermore, if your fund that you own was in the top quartile in the last five years, there is almost a guarantee that it's going to be in the bottom quartile for the next five years. And when I say almost a guarantee, there's actually less than a 2% chance that the fund that was in the top quartile in the last five years is going to be in the top quartile in the next five years, less than a 2% chance. So that's how uh, risky it is to invest in an actively managed mutual fund or actively managed ETF. You are very likely to underperform the index. Um, and, and that's one of the things that people, people really don't understand about trying to outperform the index is even the best trained people with Ivy league educations who have access to millions of dollars to spend on research, to make their decisions, they can't outperform the index. And it sounds a little bit worse than it actually is because there's a lot of funds out there that compare themselves against an index, but don't actually have an intention of beating them. And what I'm really talking about is, uh, funds that invest on a risk adjusted basis. And most of those are done like inside of um, portfolios that are designed for like pension funds where the target return for that fund is 5%. And if you make more than 5%, it's because you took more risk than you were should to, that you were supposed to in that fund. And if, you know, as you approach that, you're supposed to reduce your risk, right? So there's a lot of funds out there that, that are not really designed to outperform the index. But, you know, when you, even when you exclude those, the numbers are as high as 80% of actively managed funds not outperforming their index. And, uh, and, and like I said, just if you're looking at past performance as a judge for future performance, whatever fund was in the, the top quartile, the top 25% of its, of its class in the last five years, almost guaranteed not to be in it for the next five years. So yeah. Uh, Dave's tips are definitely for the lower tier of finance peeps. Uh, like I said, it's not it's not all bad advice. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of really bad debt. Um, he has a lot of uh, great advice when it comes to spending, but very, uh, I, I would say not terrible advice, but not great advice when it comes to investments. 
And uh, there, there's a limit to how specific he can get on his channel as well. Because remember, you, you cannot on a television show or on a YouTube channel make recommendations to buy, sell, or hold any security. So um, let me see here. Recently watched one of Dave Ramsey's YouTube videos about giving a $300 tip to waiters on Thanksgiving Day. I thought it was interesting. I haven't seen that, but I would probably, well, number one, I probably wouldn't go out to dinner on Thanksgiving Day. But if I did go out to dinner on Thanksgiving Day, I would give a giant tip too. Because uh, you're only working on Thanksgiving Day because you're forced to work on Thanksgiving Day. I, that's one of the, the the most American holidays that's out there. I think everyone should have that day off, uh, but they don't. So especially retail workers doing the whole Black Friday thing or the Thanksgiving Day sales in, 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 ahead of Black Friday. I think that's that's almost, uh, it's not a crime. It's not almost a crime, but I do think it's a travesty. Um, but yeah, so not, I'm not a huge fan of Dave Ramsey out there. Uh, but I do see why he's got critics. I also see why people who struggle with debt, sometimes need someone to hit them over the head with the, uh, just the phrase that this is stupid and this is a terrible thing to do. Um, that you, you should only buy debt for, or you should only use debt for assets that are going to appreciate. Uh, and, and let's talk about that. Um, and student loans is one of those debts that is really not necessarily a good debt, depending on what field you're going into. And I, I think the whole United States has kind of discovered that, that you're $160,000 in debt for your degree in English, which I actually know someone who has a degree in English and has $160,000 in debt. Uh, that was not a smart decision. Uh, I know someone who has $96,000 in student debt for a master's in archaeology. That was not a smart decision either. You will never earn enough money to pay that back with a master's in archaeology. Your your earnings are probably going to top out at around $60,000 a year as a manager at a cultural resource management firm. And it basically just you're not even going to be able to, be able to pay the interest on that. So um, yeah, a, a lot of things going on there when it comes to debt. What was considered good debt before uh, student debt is not necessarily great debt now. $160,000 in debt for an engineering degree, great. $160,000 in debt for a law degree, great. Mathematics, great. Computer science, awesome. Uh, English degree, no way. Sociology sociology and psychology, bachelor's degrees have to be probably uh, some of the worst examples of people borrowing money going to school to go to school and never be able to pay it back. Um, uh, social work is one of the other ones that I've seen as well. So be very careful about borrowing money. Uh, it's not going to be forgiven forever. Uh, but I, I do expect some degree of loan student loan forgiveness here in the future. Uh, the, the, this administration is slowly chipping in away at it. And I expect that to continue in the future. Uh, and, and some of it for political reasons, of course, it just makes for good politics. Uh, fire away with any questions you guys have. I have about another 18 minutes that I'm going to spend on here. And uh, we can talk about anything you guys want to talk about. I only spent maybe 15 minutes or so talking about um, the breakthrough compound here. Um, I forget what it's called. Um, I forget what it's called. But um, it, anyway, this new breakthrough compound that was discovered through computational uh, biology, basically using AI to, to do all this. And um, I, I think that it's one of the most important discoveries that's been made this year especially when it comes to treating drug resistant, uh, bacteria. And so what did you make of, uh, money lines Q2? Um, uh, I think I made what everyone else has uh, made of money lines Q2. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And I knew that was going to be a catalyst for the stock to jump. It did jump a little bit, but it's retraced most of those gains. I think it hit a low of about a, about a buck 30 in June or so. And it's up right at about $2 a share right now. Uh, I'm interested in this company more as a shorter term speculative bet, um, less as an investment right now. I think for a long-term investment, there's probably better options than Moneyline. Um, they have a couple of things built into their business model that just ensure that they have higher expenses. Um, and, and I think that's going to hamper them going forward. It also means that they're putting less money into developing their suite of products, but uh, they, they don't have some of the natural advantages that SoFi does. Uh, one of the things that I would like to see happen um, with Upstart, though, is I would like to see them investigating the possibility of becoming a bank. Right now, they have said that's not on the table. They're satisfied with their broker business the way they're doing now, where they broker loans for other businesses. So what do you think of services and companies like 23andMe worth investing in? Um, 
I don't know if you're new to my channel or not, but I've actually talked about this a couple of times. Uh, so I, I was adopted and I didn't know anything about my biological background and uh, you know, my nationality really. Or anything. I, I knew what my adoption record said, but there was a really obvious, stupid lie in my adoption records. I mean, I remember reading these like eight years old when my sister gave them to me and thinking whoever wrote these was an idiot. And I was eight years old. Uh, it said something really stupid, like your grandmother was a bookkeeper for the Khan dynasty. I'm like, well, she was 700 years old then. Uh, but I mean, anyway, that's what got me interested in taking 23 and me is I really wanted to find out what my, uh, genetic background was. I did that. I paid $200 for the health information and, uh, the ancestry, the ancestry is very, very interesting. I, I did find a couple of close relatives on 23 and me and on ancestry that helped me unravel my entire family tree. But that's not what actually is very important. 23 and me's product is not, um, uh, is not their ancestry test or their health screening. Their product is your data. It is your genome. You are submitting your entire genome to them. And when you sign up for that service, you actually give them permission to share that data, of course, stripped out of any, was stripped with uh, any identifying information stripped out of it, but they're sharing that data and they're using their computational genomics to derive insights from that data. Also based on the questions that you answer. Uh, you answering those health questions and health, health screening questions, talking about the things that you are involved in, um, basically helps them create all of these associations. So um, the actual decoding of the genome back in the 1990s, the, the decoding of the genome by itself was probably one of the least impactful, most expensive uh, scientific discoveries of the 20th century. And the real uh, interesting work didn't happen until a couple of de decades later when we finally figured out that it wasn't single genes. Uh, it wasn't particulate. There weren't single genes that were responsible for most of the things that happened in the human body. It was the, the, the uh, combinations of genes, which are far too complex to figure out the millions of different, billions of different, com uh, com I think there's three and a half billion base pairs of, uh, of DNA in, in everyone's uh, genome and that's not even counting their ex the, the exome um and one of the wild things you find out is about eight percent of your gene genome is not even human it comes from uh from uh you know human endogenous retroviruses so basically it's viruses that somehow uh fooled your uh your genome into making copies of themselves that definitely some of that uh eight percent has actual purposes particularly with with uh with uh, protein synthesis and some of it doesn't appear to have any purpose whatsoever it just makes a copy of itself uh, every time your cells make a copy of themselves. But the, the that's what people don't understand about 23andMe is the intention of this company was never to tell you about your ancestry. It was to gather your uh, the, the information on your genome to uh, to form better ideas and associations and to aid in this computational genomics revolution. So uh, 23andMe would have one of the larger data sets out there in terms of um, you know, the amount of DNA they collected. The last time I looked, and it was a couple of years ago, they had over 10 million individuals who had taken 23andMe tests. And based on the number of notices I get for new relatives, that number is just growing and growing and growing. So I think that that would be uh, pretty, pretty amazing. So, uh, oh, uh, thank you. If this is your first live stream, yesterday was actually a live stream too. There's always a bit of a risk talking about really complex things on a live stream, the risk of sounding like an idiot when I'm talking about something that I'm not an expert in, which is uh, this breakthrough compound that's destroying this, this drug resistant bacteria, and then trying to weave it back into an area that you can invest in. Basically, I'm a, I'm a nerd who really likes making money based on the things, the things that I can figure out. So, uh, and, and this is, and, and thank you for subscribing. So, um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm always open to questions, guys. I usually do these live streams for about an hour a day, Monday through Thursday. I take Fridays off to go surfing or do whatever. Um, uh, lately, I've had a little bit less time to make videos because my daughter started volleyball and I've been shuttling her everywhere, putting something like 200 kilometers a day in my car. And so definitely looking to buy a bunch of car here pretty soon. So definitely looking to do that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So any, any questions you guys might have about uh, individual stocks, we can talk about those too. Just always remember that it's not a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any securities. Um, those can't really make those uh, online here. Tesla, I, have, I get a lot of questions about Tesla usually, uh, especially about price action around Tesla. 
Tesla is just a highly volatile stock, guys. I wouldn't read uh, any single day's movement in Tesla as a trend or anything like that. And um, yeah, so I, I wanted to talk about the Fed uh, minutes, but I realize it's not a subject that, that interests everyone. So I'll take specific questions on that if you guys have specific questions. But other than that, I'm just going to say that I think that uh, the market is basically waiting to see what they think is the Fed is going to do at the next meeting. I am anticipating another 75% or 75 basis point rise uh, interest rate rise. I think that by early next year, we're going to be short-term rates are going to be at four, four and a half percent, which is going to suck money out of the stock market, guys. And I've talked about this before on the channel too. Having worked for a regional bank uh, before and having worked uh, in the investment world for a long time, I worked with a lot of people that were referred to me who had a million dollars in a savings account, $2 million in a savings account, who sat through what I talked about, but really had no interest at all in investing in the stock market if they could get three or 4% in CDs over six months. Now, a CD or any deposit account that is risk-free is never priced for you to actually make money. Uh, but there are millions of people that don't actually care that they won't beat inflation and taxes over time in their CD accounts. So, um, yeah. So any thoughts on Polestar? Yeah, I, I think Polestar, um, number one, their sales in the United States are a lot better than I thought they were going to be. And underground, they're doing, uh, at least under the radar here, they're doing a lot more business than I thought they were. Um, I have not seen, and there's probably a higher concentration of electric vehicles here in Southern California than anywhere outside of like Norway and Iceland, right? Um, th those countries are the only one, and, and the Netherlands, those countries are the only ones that have a higher concentration of electric vehicles on the road. But I cannot drive anywhere right now on my daily commute. And, and today I almost panicked because I looked around, and because I, I have a lot of Tesla stock, I looked around on the road and didn't see a Tesla for, I don't know, 35 seconds until one passed me. Uh, so it, it basically anytime I'm driving, I can see a Tesla. Not only that, I'm seeing uh, at least a dozen other vehicles uh, that are electric as well on the road. This is a revolution that is absolutely happening. I, I happen to be from a place where, uh, where where everyone is heavily dependent, originally from a place where everyone's heavily dependent on the oil industry. And that's, that's how I got my professional start as well, was working in IT for the oil industry. And... Um, and I, I, the resistance to the uh, uh, to the electric revolution is, is fascinating in a way. Uh, a lot of folks are not willing to break the mindset that a large portion. I mean, gasoline is not going anywhere in its entirety for a while. Oil is not going to be completely useless. It still has a ton of uses outside of transportation. But a lot of our transportation is going to be electric here in the future. And it's not going to be just limited to people that are upper middle class and above. Um, we're looking at right now that the average cost of a vehicle in the United States is approaching what the cost of a base model Tesla 3 or uh, base uh, model Tesla 3 is. So I think that is highly encouraging. And we're looking at cheaper models, which are cheaper in every way, being closer to that $30,000 price point, which is basically what a Toyota, a base model Toyota Corolla goes for these days. So, uh, yeah. Um, let me see here. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't want to talk about this today. Um, yeah, so, uh, Vane did want to talk about this day. I haven't actually been fishing lately. Like literally I have zero time other than this hour a day to do my live streams. Uh, I got invited on two fishing trips this week and had to turn them down because I'm too busy shuttling my daughter around to um, to uh, volleyball practice. And yesterday she got recruited by the wrestling coach. So later on, she's going to be starting wrestling. Apparently, she just went into the wrestling room, took all the girls from her volleyball team, and they all started wrestling on the mat. And the coach was just absolutely thrilled. And one of the other girls on the wrestling team actually used to train at my jujitsu academy. I was her uh, jujitsu coach, too. So uh, that's kind of interesting. So um, this right here, uh, the the Chemical Society and of Minerals in Chile, or Sociedad Química y Minera de Chile, uh, they are heavily involved in uh, lithium mining. And I do think that this is uh, a company to keep an eye on. Their uh, earnings per share has gone down largely on the back of, of, of higher expenses here and largely on the back of what they are sinking into uh, developing lithium mining techniques and, uh, and and securing mineral rights 
and just getting ready for the lithium revolution. It's going to be absolutely huge here in the future. Uh, Vane, also, thank you so much for uh, the super sticker. Uh, I, I did forget to remind people that those uh, those features are on at all times. And I do think that this is a very good EV play. As far as investing in a company or a country in Latin America, um, that, so investing in Latin America has been problematic in the past. Um, we, we Prior to uh, Hugo Chavez, um, Venezuela actually looked like a pretty good place to invest your money for a lot of different reasons. Colombia is a country that's on its way up, uh, or at least it has been up until the, the latest election. We'll see what happens. It looks like it's been on its way up in terms of investment opportunities because of all the money that's been invested in there. Uh, I want to see what the new administration does. But, uh, but markets in Latin America are maturing, and it's looking like a better and better place to invest. But in particular, Chile has been a great place to invest for a, for a very long time. Uh, a lot of the issues with corruption are not anywhere near as prevalent in Chile as they are in other Latin American countries for whatever reason. Uh, I, but but that is, uh, that's something that I find very interesting. Now, they do have a really high dividend yield uh, right now, 10.68%. That doesn't seem to be sustainable to me. The earnings per share is uh, 4.58. PDE is about 20, which is maybe a little bit above industry average here. Uh, they did have an earnings beat, though, as uh, as, as Bain said here. Um, hold on. All right. So they had, did have declining earnings through 2020. You're seeing much greater earnings here in, in, uh, in 2021. Some of that had to do not with lithium, but a lot of that had to do, I think, with copper mining. But the price of copper has crashed in the last couple of months. So we'll see what their full year results look like for 2020. But this is a company that's been making a profit at least for the last four years. Uh, they have a lot of hold, a few buy, and a couple strong buy recommendations. Very few uh, underperform or sell recommendations. The mean recommendation, though, is uh, right between buy and hold at this point. So take that with a grain of salt, of course. But I do think as a longer-term investment, uh, they look to benefit from the EV revolution. Yep. So uh, let me see here. Are you still getting a Cybertruck? The the, the electric F-150 does look pretty cool. And I, here's the thing. I cannot stand the way the Cybertruck looks. But um, the way it looks is going to be one of the things that holds the cost down because most of the panels on that are flat, which means that they don't have to be pressed and shaped, which saves manufacturing time and saves manufacturing expense. Also, the fact that it's not a painted vehicle, it's, uh, it's basically just stainless steel or what, and whatever uh, uh, you know space age uh, coating they put on top of that uh, looks really good. The performance capabilities, I'll be honest with you, I'm not going to use most of those performance capabilities. I need the truck to haul around sheets of plywood so I can build my next boat and to tow the boat that I do have because I do like to build boats just for fun. And I, I haven't quite figured out what my next boat project is going to be, but it's probably going to be like a 26-footer. Uh, I just finished building an 18-footer. And uh, I do like the electric F-150 and I have had the chance to take a look at one. And I'm telling you guys, the best thing about this truck is that it's set up for, for work. It's set up for a contractor. Now, I, I realize that a vast majority of people that buy a truck are never going to throw 10 sheets of plywood in the back of that truck. They're never going to use it. They're never going to use it for anything that a truck should be used for. It's really just for looks, Right. Uh, but they made, I think Ford made the smart decision, uh, making it really contractor friendly. So people that do like handyman that do local work and things like that can use it as a power source to power all of their other electric equipment. We are looking at states and municipalities that are outlawing two stroke technology for, for like lawn equipment and things like that. I think electric is going to be the way to go and you're going to be able to use your truck to power your equipment. So, um, yeah, they did raise the prices on their trucks. And uh, they cited commodity prices as Eric M notes, and uh, I think and that's going across the board. I don't necessarily see prices going down, um, although Tesla has a long history of lowering prices when their costs go down, right? Um, so riding declining cost curves. Uh, no, I mean you, you always in this case you're not riding a declining cost curve. Uh, in terms of manufacturing because of, uh, of of increasing commodity prices. But it is a fact that, um, and, and I've heard the argument before, that the decline in, uh, in in batteries is really due to the decline in the uh, in, in the price of the underlying commodities. 
but that's not necessarily true. And in fact, there's a there's an important academic study that was done on this, I think in 2018, which basically said that now is going to be the moment to uh, to start riding that cost decline, decline curve down because it's no longer dependent on declining commodity prices, but really dependent on the declining cost of manufacture as they uh, doubled their their sequential total of, of battles or batteries over and over and over. So, and that's cost curve decline is only going to increase as more people get into the business and, uh, and, and new manufacturing techniques are discovered and shared by shared, I mean, stolen across the industry. So that is going to happen. And let's see, thanks to finding words. I found BYD and I'm up 102% on them since. And, you know, I, despite the fact that I talk about BYD all the time, I don't actually own that many shares. Um, and it's just when I've had the money to buy shares, I, uh, I, I the, the price has been too high. And when the price has been low, I haven't had the money to buy as many shares of as, as I like. So I only have like 341 shares of BOID at this point. I would love to have more, but what's holding me back right now is actually the political concerns with uh, China. Now, BYD is a company that uh, that is is fully in compliance with uh, GAAP standards. Uh, it's probably the the most boring out of the EV companies right now in a lot of ways in terms of their management. I Meaning they the, the the manager just doesn't like to attract attention. It's the largest EV company out there in terms of like number of employees. I think they have like two hundred sixty thousand employees right now. They're the third or fourth or no fourth or fifth largest battery producer at this point. They have their own battery technology that looks fantastic. The Blade battery. Uh, this is the company that is slated to grow and grow and grow. Now they've never produced more than I think about one point two million uh, vehicles per year. And I, and the peak would have been, I think, around 2014, 2015, if I if I recall. But Warren Buffett's interest in BYD has never been about their vehicles. It's always been about their battery production. And originally, it wasn't about the battery production for electric vehicles. It was about batteries for all other applications. Um, and I, I think that is likely to change. I think BYD is probably going to be um, a supplier of batteries to dozens of other startup companies uh, on the planet. And it's going to be their lithium iron phosphate blade battery that kind of leads the way. It's extremely safe. It's extremely cheap and extremely reliable. Has a cycle life between uh, four and 5,000 cycles, means meaning that your standard battery in uh, a, a compact that has 220 miles of range uh, is basically going to have a life of over a million miles. And and when that life of over a million miles uh, is over, the battery still re uh, retains about 70% of its capacity. It's going to have a second life in stationary energy storage somewhere. So uh, the need to, and, and and all the materials in this uh, lithium iron phosphate battery are recyclable with today's technology. technology. It's just that no one's doing it at this point. So at some point, someone's going to need to step in to recycle all of these batteries. So yeah, uh, Frenic Pillow says, are you still holding Xpeng? Yes, I'm still holding Xpeng. Xpeng is, uh, and and uh, I still hold Neo too, but I've priced my call options on that fairly aggressively, uh, not very far above uh, current price today. Uh, and and I and, and I'm buying, I'm selling them out at six weeks and eight weeks at about twenty two dollars a share right now, uh, because I do want to dispose of Neo, um, not because I think it's a bad company. Uh, Neo is another one of those companies that has almost like religious like devotion to it, kind of like Apple. Um, and I've chosen to concentrate my risk in, uh, in Xpeng right now with the understanding that we run the risk of delisting at this point. Uh, but, but I like, uh, Xpeng's manufacturing model quite a bit more. I like their balance sheet quite a bit more, and I like their focus on, uh, a wider market segment segment quite a bit more as well. So, um, th those are the reasons I, I bought those, uh, Neo just got in too much political trouble early on in their career. And now they have people involved in their business that I'd rather not have them involved in their business. So, um, so what's your opinion? Alibaba is clearly undervalued, but the fact that it's a Chinese company has really put downward pressure on the share price. Uh, I agree with that. Um, so Alibaba, it's not a government owned company. So it's not one of the ones that was uh, initially facing delisting. I think it has been put on a D-list watch list at this point. They are not fully compliant with uh, with, with uh, reporting standards here. They're mostly compliant, but not fully compliant with reporting standards. The problem is, is that uh, if it comes down to it, Alibaba may be one of the companies that uh, China says has too much importance to their national security, and they may not allow that 
they may not allow full reporting. Um, and if you think about it too, this could happen with a lot of the auto companies as well. I want to think that the data gathered by all of these auto companies with LIDAR and with cameras and uh, with all kinds of other recordings, this is an incredible source of, of data that could be exploited by uh, foreign governments. And the same goes for Tesla as well. Like if I was in charge of the Tesla military or the uh, Chinese military, I wouldn't let a Tesla be parked anywhere near a military facility. I'd make you park it elsewhere and then uh, take a shuttle into work or something like that. If your office, if one of your officers or enlisted guy, I don't imagine enlisted guys own Teslas in China, but I imagine a few officers do. So um, yeah, but Bob, but Alibaba is clearly undervalued. A lot of that discount comes from the fact that it's a Chinese company. A lot of that discount comes from uh, political risk. And another thing that's happening right now is there is the risk of uncertainty. There's a huge risk of uncertainty in China right now. There's systematic risk in, in uh, China right now when it comes to a debt crisis. So I fully expect that the Chinese government is going to step in rather aggressively uh, in that field. So uh, Ford and Tesla use BYD now. Yep. Um, okay. Not, not, not sure what you're trying to say there. I think you're trying to say that BYD is now cheap. Uh, I don't know if it's cheap, uh, but I do think it's a solid investment for the future. And I do think it's actually hard to value uh, ba based on the breadth of their operations and where they plan on going next. So they've been selling vehicles for a while in Australia, Indonesia, uh, and, and a little bit in Europe. Uh, and, they, and they've had some successes and some failures in those markets. They have a more hybrid strategy than most of these other companies do, where they're still fully invested in their uh, hybrid uh, vehicle technologies. And I expect that to continue because I think there's there's going to be a market for hybrids for quite some time. But they actually have a huge lineup of plug-in hybrid vehicles that, that work very well. You can drive them for 100 miles just on battery power alone before the engine, uh, the engine kicks in. And I think that that model might end up being a little bit more popular in the future than it is today. It, it didn't, those models did not sell well here in the United States. I'm not talking about BYD models. I'm talking about plug-in, uh, uh, plug-in hybrid models like, uh, uh, like the Prius. It did not sell as well as I thought. So, um, okay. Yeah. Batteries are used and bought by Tesla and Ford. And I think there's going to be a lot more. So can you rank Rivian, Lucid, Fisker, Canoe, Polestar, Arrival in order of risk as you see them? Um, uh, Arrival and Canoe are at the bottom. Uh, Fisker is right above them. Um, Lucid and Polestar actually probably have a, a, a better chance than, than Fisker does. And I'd put Lucid, I'd put Polestar actually above Lucid. And I know Lucid folks are going to think I'm crazy for that, but I would put Polestar above Lucid for a, a couple of different reasons. N number one, it's the organization of their parent company. Uh, Lucid is on their own. Um, they, they do have some backing from the Saudi government. They are planning to open up a, a, a big facility there, which makes a lot of sense. A, a luxury Lucid vehicle is going to have a ready market in uh, everywhere in the oil states like uh, like Qatar uh, and uh, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, uh, even in Iraq with wealthy people there. It's, it's going to have a ready market there that, that it's not going to cost you a lot to export. Also, to uh, wealthy people in Southeast Asia as well. And it's, and, and, and it's actually... I think that Saudi Arabia could be a greater manufacturing hub than it is if they decided to invest in that just because of its central location, uh, access to the Suez Canal, uh, to European markets and all that. So I think it could be a greater manufacturing hub if they would invest in manufacturing, uh, but they're not really doing that. And I put Rivian at the top of that list in terms of being the best risk, just because the market for trucks is so freaking huge. The market for trucks is, is, is amazing. And and it's, you know, the, the forward F-150 has been the best selling vehicle in the United States for like 40 years running with zero competition. But that doesn't mean there aren't millions of other trucks that are being sold out there as well and people competing in that space. And uh, I think the Rivian vehicle is a fine vehicle as well, but uh, they, they do have their work cut out for them. They definitely have their work cut out for them. All right. So I'm up on, a, on an hour and eight minutes today. I'm going to go ahead and sign off today. I did want to say thank you to all of my regulars. And I did want to uh, recognize Martov as um, I think my newest subscriber. And, uh, all, and I try to do these uh, live streams Monday through Thursday with very few breaks. Uh, tomorrow though, I'm taking a break and going surfing or I'm going to train jujitsu because I haven't trained in a week now. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much. And you folks have a nice day. I will see you on Monday.